A man wakes up in an unknown dark room and hears a voice calling him by his name, Vladimir Ognev. The man is disoriented and doesn't understand where he is. However, he remembers that he is the head of the research department of the Japanese branch of the organization. He is there because a war is starting and soon everyone will die. The voice offers to prevent this and asks him to talk about himself. Vladimir was born in the USSR, but in 1994, when the war in Chechnya began, his parents emigrated to the USA. The Ognev family first lived in Oklahoma, then in California. Vladimir studied at Berkeley, where he became a specialist in social psychology and studied the influence of religion and belief on a person. Memories take the man back to a lecture hall, where he talks about how the entire history of humanity is a history of faith. Since ancient times, religions have constantly been evolving, becoming more complex. Believers have come a long way from believing in nature spirits to the concept of a single god. Nowadays, science has become a religion, as people believe that scientists will explain everything happening around them. Vladimir is listened to with great attention, and in the front row sits his fiancée Anna, who can't take her eyes off the scientist. The speaker is only interrupted once when an unknown man enters the hall, and Vladimir continues talking about how a person sees and feels an unimaginably small part of the real world, and most importantly, it's impossible to correctly assess the level of human development without an alternative. To adequately assess the level of human development, another type of fully intelligent being is required. After the presentation, Vladimir and Anna celebrate the event in a bar, but the young people want some privacy and they go out into the corridor where the same unknown man named Osiri rudely pulls Vladimir away from his fiancée. He is interested in Vladimir's research, especially the part about an alternative to humanity which the scientist himself considers fantasy. But, Osiri tells him that the UN is actually funding such research and offers Vladimir a position at a university in Florida. The man refuses because he plans to get married and move to Washington. But after hearing about the offer of a large grant, he agrees to think about it. At night, he shares his thoughts with his fiancée. A person perceives only a few percent of the real world. Humans can't sense a dog's smell or a bat's hearing, nor can they see in the dark. Language can't describe quantum mechanics, and the mind doesn't understand dark matter. So, why are people so confident about their understanding of the world? Adequate self-assessment is the only salvation from the next world war. Anna agrees to go anywhere with him, just to be together. Vladimir finds himself again in the dark corridor, alone with the voice, confessing that he would give anything to change the past and be with Anna again. He remembers his work in Florida. He was immediately given statistics and a group to study. The experiment involved three groups of subjects. The first was told that aliens exist, but that there is no evidence. The second was told that aliens exist, they are far away, and the evidence is indirect. And the third group was told that aliens are here, on Earth. The evidence was very convincing and stated that contact occurred 50 years ago. During the Cold War, four ships suddenly appeared in the sky over Florida, Leningrad, Tokyo, and Melbourne. The fate of humanity changed, and the war was averted. The peace became a gift from unknown forces. Vladimir studies the subject's reactions to this knowledge, realizing it's all true. His world is turned upside down. But what concerns him most is that he can't share this with his wife, with whom he lives in a small house by the ocean. Anna is happy and wants to have his child. He can't shatter her belief in a secure future, though he himself has lost faith in the righteousness of the world order. Vladimir believes that humans should not have survived. If a nuclear war had started, humanity would have perished. The aliens dispersed them like a herd of foolish animals. Humans should have matured on their own, but they were deprived of that. Later, Vladimir begins his work. One day, he steps out for coffee with a colleague and confesses his desire to make contact, arguing it's impossible to study human reactions to aliens without having seen them himself. His colleague admits to having experienced such contact, describing it as unforgettable. Meanwhile, Vladimir and Anna learn that they're having a boy, a period of immense happiness for the scientist. It ends when their child is born dead. The doctor explains that in some areas, cosmic radiation levels have inexplicably risen, significantly increasing infant mortality for 20 years. The cause is unknown, but as a university teacher, Vladimir could help. However, 
he refuses to cooperate. Anna returns from the hospital, utterly devastated, and to Vladimir, it seems like it's always raining over him. His wife stops talking to Vladimir and spends her days lying on the couch. Finally, Vladimir tells his wife that the alien ships are responsible. The radiation levels are rising in the cities beneath these ships, causing children's deaths. But Anna doesn't believe him. The day comes when Vladimir directly asks his boss to include him in the contactor group, threatening to leave the organization otherwise. After this conversation, he goes to the ocean, attempting to stop his life, but inexplicably survives and rushes home, where he finds his wife in a bloody bathtub and saves her life. He never sees her again as she flies to her parents. The leadership informs him that his request for contact has been granted. In Tokyo, he's appointed head of a special, well-funded group and departs. The day of contact arrives. Vladimir meets those who have been honored. The UN secretary, the US president's advisor, members of state departments from various countries, and even a French scientist, a Nobel laureate. The group enters a hall where people lay on the floor in special warm sleeping bags, discussing the questions that they'll ask the aliens. The temperature in the room starts to drop, and soon, a voice in their heads asks what humans have done since the last session when they shared some technologies. The UN UN representative assures that Israel started desalination production, as the aliens warned that they couldn't hold back global warming any longer. The ongoing military conflicts concern them, which Earth's leadership promised to end, and if they can't do it themselves, they should simply ask for help. The French request permission to fly to Mars in 2030, but they are denied, with the statement that humanity is not yet ready. Hearing this, Vladimir reminds them of the omnipotence paradox. Can God create a stone that he himself can not lift? If the aliens can change the climate and end wars, why don't they do it? After the meeting, Vladimir is introduced to Michael, a special services agent, who realizes that Vladimir has now decided to study the aliens themselves, not just human reactions to them. Later, the scientist closely observes an anthill and requests additional funding in devices that simulate the evolution of insect social behavior. He's unsure if people really see the alien ships or just their avatars. There's been no new data about the aliens for 50 years, and there's no guarantee their behavior will remain the same. It's known that this is an alternative form of life to humans. What if it's a collective mind? Therefore, it's necessary to model a form with a unified mind, but without individual personalities. This will help to assess the morality and goals of the aliens. Vladimir begins developing a hypothesis and realizes that the alien mind is millions of years ahead of the human mind. It's impossible to understand them. To the aliens, humans are like like monkeys throwing stones at a nuclear reactor. Later, while talking with friends, he speculates that humanity awaits the same fate and the aliens see in them not ants, but themselves. However, humans seem to be fixated on individuality. The aliens have likely abandoned individuality, leaving behind mental problems. But What's the point of a person without uniqueness? Soon, Vladimir is appointed head of the department. Years pass, and his research makes no progress. He can neither disprove nor confirm the theory of the collective mind. One day, he receives a letter from Anna, in which she writes that she waited all these years for his apologies, and he didn't even write. She hates him for this. Later, Vladimir is urgently summoned to St. Petersburg for another contact. Michael admits that this contact was requested by the aliens. Maybe they intend to move to a new level of relations with humans and give them new technology. But Vladimir cannot predict the behavior of a different intelligence. The scientist, along with a group of influential figures, goes to the contact hall and lays in a sleeping bag. Everything happens as it did the last time. But today, the aliens have called representatives of world governments to announce their decision. They have observed humans for many years, but now intend to take action and demand that humans immediately destroy all weapons of mass destruction and disband armies around the world, erase borders, and unite humanity. Otherwise, Earthlings face total annihilation. The world leaders regain consciousness and ask Vladimir to explain the aliens' demands, but he is just as stunned as they are and cannot provide a definitive answer. He speculates that the aliens 
having studied humans well, might be testing them. The leaders agree on one thing. They cannot remain defenseless against the aliens. Moreover, it turns out that Earth has developed Petropolis, a project involving shafts with nuclear missiles aimed at the alien ships all over the planet. Humans can launch a simultaneous attack, destroying the aliens within half an hour. The leaders depart, but Michael is sure that they will start a war. The role of the aliens is unclear. They have forbidden space exploration and dictated humanity's actions for many years. Vladimir even suspects that the aliens can read human thoughts. Nevertheless, he is certain that everything must be done to try and prevent a nuclear strike on the ships. Later, Vladimir goes home and suddenly feels the urge to step out into the street where a carnival is taking place. At the same time, his house is being searched and Anna rushes to the ocean, feeling an unexplainable anxiety. Vladimir impulsively leaves his car and seems to run through all the memorable places of his life. He meets his wife and they embrace against the backdrop of launching missiles. But all of this turns out to be just his dream. The next minute, two strong men get into the car and inject him. Vladimir wakes up in a dark room, where Michael rushes in, having learned that the aliens had already contacted the scientists ten years ago when he tried to end his life in the ocean. For some reason, they helped him then. He returned home and managed to save Anna, although she didn't appreciate it. In the water, Vladimir saw his living, grown son, radiating the same warmth he later felt during contact. Michael asks the scientist to directly appeal to the aliens to save the world, but Vladimir can't do it. He doesn't know how. Disappointed, Michael shoots himself in the head. The planet then perishes in cataclysms, but Vladimir still receives his reward. He suddenly finds himself in a completely empty St. Petersburg, where his wife and son meet him. The creators left the ending open, allowing each viewer to interpret it in their own way. However, the director explained that in his vision, the protagonist, like a new Adam, arrives in a reset world, so everything on Earth can start anew.